Hello, my name's Simon Kane, and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 36. For those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, TV, and today, writing and book publishing. Sarah Savinsky is a commissioner of comedy, gift, and humor books at Ebury Random House, which is one of the world's largest publishers. I got on the podcast to talk about how to get your book noticed and published by Ebury or Random House, what they're looking for, the commissioning process, uh, going from A to B, their opinions on Amazon and self-publishing, and pretty much everything in between. Uh, It was a really interesting interview, and I think anyone who wants to get a book published or wants to self-publish could get a lot out of it. Um, I won't say much more. I just want to put a quick shout-out to my latest patron, which is UFID Studios. They are a production house which deals with uh, London-based content generation and comedy clips for the internet. So if you would like to check them out, if you'd like to check them out, if you want to type in UFID Studio into YouTube, you should be able to find their channel and find all the content they've put up so far. If you are uh, enjoying this podcast, please do remember to subscribe and rate it in iTunes if you have a minute. Just give it an honest review, wherever you think, whatever you think it's worth, uh, and that would be amazing. I do read them all, and so do the future guests, so it really helps out. Without any more delays, this is Sarah Savinsky. Have you done a podcast before? No. Oh, okay, fine. Um, don't worry about it. It's, right. it's only going to go on the internet for millions of people to hear. Great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you were saying about Dan and Phil and yes. niches. Yes. I wanted to know more about... Because I think when people hear the word niche, they think small. Yeah. And they're not. But how do you look for niches when you're looking for books then? Because obviously you need to find something that hasn't been covered before. Yeah, so I think um, it's about finding people who have dedicated audiences. Um, You know, whether it's a celebrity or it's a a Tumblr account. Um, You know, they are people who are drawn to that person or thing. Um, that they love and feel passionate about, and they could be there could be seven million of them, but they are dedicated to this this thing that perhaps the rest of the universe don't know about. Mm. And in that respect, they are kind of what we would call the kind of dedicated niche market. Mm. Um, and it's it's just kind of tapping into to seeing what's going on in the world. You know, um, the internet is amazing for that, and you can find <laughs> yeah. so many weird and wonderful things on there and suddenly realise there are thousands of you looking at this weird and wonderful thing. Mm. Um, and f- for me, it's about kind of just seeing what's out there, exploring, exploring the world, going out into London, looking for things that people are seeing and doing, and then also sat at my desk online checking out what's happening. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. For uh, The interesting thing for me is where a book, or, or in your case a book, goes from being just a thing for that niche market to a wider scope. Yeah. So like with Dan and Phil, um, obviously they could have self-published that, and yeah. I'm sure it would have sold lots. Same with Zoella, like a while ago, where you know she had that book out. I mean, at what stage do you go... Right, this should really be published, not just uh, not, not not just a thing someone who has a fan base is dealing with. Um, that's a, it's quite a difficult question to answer actually, because I think you know there's lots of merit in someone deciding to kind of self-publish. Mm. And um, for me, I think the tipping point um, with with wh- whoever um, it is where we're looking into is when we think that more people should be seeing and listening and hearing about what these people are up to or what they have to say um and trying to take them to a wider a wider audience or at least um give them perhaps a bigger platform to publish into rather than self-publish which um often can get lost and publishers are giving a service to people in a way that perhaps when you self-publish you don't get yeah i know what you mean because you guys publish I don't know how many books a year, which means you have a, I wouldn't say like a factory line, but you have like a process for it, I assume. So from taking the book on to getting it edited, getting it marketed, getting... So yeah, so maybe if we go from like, so say you've found someone someone you want to do work with that you've never worked before. It could be a YouTuber or something Mm -hmm. like that, or it could just be someone who's written their own book before and now you've found that they're writing another one, for example. What's the process? Yeah, what's, what's the process? Okay, so um, usually we have team meetings uh, once a week where we discuss things we've noticed, things we've seen, um, and we discuss them just as a group of editors. Um, and then from there on in, we'll either 
um, approach that talent or approach their management and see if they're interested in in writing a book or if they're already working on something in which case you know we'd love to see the material and then we have an acquisitions meeting uh, there uh, once every two weeks and we have to present that um, person or that proposal to the rest of the team um, the rest of team consists of their MD, the publisher here, deputy publisher, um, heads of marketing, sales, um, publicity and it's a team decision about whether we move that, that project forward and make an offer to the, to the author or talent. Then once it's acquired uh, or you know once we've kind of exchanged offers and, and gone through the negotiation process um, you know we, we give our authors a schedule um, for them to work within and we give them a pub date and everything's made quite clear when we want the manuscript in uh, when we want the person to um, you know have have it completely sorted and so we can give it a structural edit and then we arrange for the copy editor to step in after that stage um, and they have chance all along the way to kind of review everything that's going on so they're, they're completely in the loop um, and once it's been copy edited, the author has a chance to take in all the queries. Um, with non-fiction, um, especially autobiographies, for example, they'll definitely need to go to a lawyer. Um, so we, you know, there's <laughs> yeah. always that process involved too. And then after that, it's proofreading and typesetting. Mm. Um, so there's lots of little stages, but mm. that kind of takes up a good, I'd say, if you acquire in 2015 and you want the book out in 2016, little stages suddenly become quite big deal um, yes. along the way. Yes, especially if one's knocking onto the other and, yes. and vice versa. Yeah, I yeah, I can relate to that. Um <laughs> and and so at the moment are you putting I mean obviously you've worked with Dan and Phil and you've and you I assume starting to work with more and more people who have their own audiences as it mm-hmm. were. At what stage? I mean cuz the thing is you you can look at a celebrity and go they clearly have an audience of people that like them and and we can see that because they're on TV or whatever and then you can do the same with social media numbers and stuff at what stage would you start like actually looking for someone or are you just are you sort of waiting for the zeitgeist to come to you if that makes sense like what's what kind of what's your what's your range of outreach versus kind of just stuff floating Coming towards yeah um Ebri are really fantastic and this is what I love and this is what how I started out in that um, we're go-getters so um, we kind of don't sit around and wait for things to fall in our laps and um, you know if we spot something we and we think there's something really amazing to be to be made whether it's someone who's blogging about something or whether it's a celebrity and we will go out there and try and make it happen um, and that's what I love about my job. If, if anything, I enjoy seeing trends and, and seeing what people are reading and thinking, hey, this could make a brilliant book, let's mm. make it happen. Mm. Um, but, you know, obviously we are also um, hugely dependent on agents submitting things to us, mm. which is the more of the kind of falling on your lap yeah, type yeah. Of, of thing, obviously. Um, a whole lot of work goes into what they do when they send you these these uh, authors or, or ideas um, but uh, we haven't necessarily kind of gone out and pursued those ones mm. um, so I'd say that f- I, I personally feel that probably 80% of the books I've acquired have been books that I've seen either in a newspaper or online or whatever and, um, and gone after myself mm. Okay, that's pretty cool and yeah, you were saying that uh, is it Random House don't accept stuff without an agent, but Ebri do, or or you can. Um, it's it's a strange one. I think that there's a kind of, from what I understand, there's a kind of there's not really a slush pile um, right. here, and I don't think you. Do you want to explain what a slush pile is to someone who doesn't know? Yes. Sorry, go so on. that's um, when uh, authors or people who don't have agents just submit to publishers mm. um, their proposals or their chapter breakdowns um synopsis that kind of thing um we don't tend to accept those so most things should come through an agent but you know i do get emails from 
uh, journalists, for example, who might be working on a real life story. And in a way, they are almost an agent for the person who they're trying to represent with the real life story. So yeah. they're sort of like a ghostwriter. So they're not completely unagented, um, but they don't necessarily have a literary agent who represents them. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So we don't really encourage just anyone to send us <laughs> any old thing. Um, you know, it's it, there's so much kind of. Um, so many advantages to having an agent and I think um, if you're really serious they're able to help you kind of shape your proposals in the right way Mm. that when they land on an editor's desk it's really clear what this Mm. book is and how it's positioned um, in the market and those kind of things. Yeah totally. I've just finished reading um, Ape How to Publish a Book. Do you know that one? I know I haven't read that. It's uh, author, publisher, entrepreneur. It's like telling you how to self-publish your own book kind of thing and in it has a glossary of terms so and I just I I pre-read those before I came here again (laughs) because I was like I'm gonna need to know them. You're definitely going to talk some sort <laughs> yes. of business thing. But then I thought, no one else is doing that. <laughs> We've got to have that, haven't you? Um, so, one sec. Um, and you were saying, like, uh, self-publishing a book is... Uh, well, you said that there's a lot of merit to that. Um, how is it viewed from your end in terms of people that are self-publishing books? I mean, are you for it, against it? I think that if you have a story to tell and you want to put it out there, then you should go ahead and uh, and do that. You know, there are so many authors who've, who afterwards have found a publishing home to take that book to perhaps a wider audience than they could have done. And, to, and, and by that I mean, um, you know, publishers are able to get books into the shops much easier than when you self-publish. Um, yep. <laughs> and, you know, obviously there's amazing platforms on, on Amazon that allow you to self-publish and there are publishing companies, I think that's what you call them, who help yeah. the authors to self-publish, but obviously there's a cost involved to the mm. author there. Um, which you would normally which absorb. W- yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Um so I think if, if you're really passionate about it and you're happy to commit in that way, then I think it's a great thing to do. And um, I, you know, I don't really view self-publishing in kind of a negative way. Um, and I think lots of, as I say, lots of books have been acquired by publishing houses when they were originally self-published. I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey is a oh, was great... Was that self-published? Yes. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. See, I should have just done that research <laughs> rather than... That's amazing. Okay. Yeah, so, you know... You know, there are times when it really kind of works in both ways. She'd had a really successful self-published mm. book, but then a publisher comes along and is able to offer a brand new platform for that book, and obviously it went on to sell even more copies. So, yeah. um, you know, that's really quite something special. It's probably quite a strong, should we say, opening gambit to go into you if you could say, oh, my book's already sold 5,000 copies off my own back, yeah. because then you can go, oh, well, without us doing any research, we know there's a bit of a market for yeah. it. So, yeah, that probably makes more sense. And also, I guess, even if it's not that book that you, you're you interested in because it's already out there, sometimes it's already out there and it's mm. re- and you can almost feel like it's reached its audience already and perhaps there's not uh, much more we can bring to the table, whereas they might have another book in them or it could be that, you know... Um, this book could be tweaked into something kind of brand new while still kind of being based on the content that was self-published so you can kind of turn it into something bigger or, yeah. or you know, that might reach a wider audience beyond yeah. that M- initial audience. Make it less reached. niche. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. And you mentioned Amazon and I, because of that book, I'm very aware of all of their self-publishing sort of create space and, and yeah. that kind of thing. Um, do you think they're getting too big? Like, what's your take on... Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that they're, they're, they're big on every kind of level, <laughs> um, but they're amazing at what they do, so mm. good for them. Um, I, you know, they work really well with with publishers. Um, obviously, lots of books are sold on their platform. Mm. So, I mean, it's it's all about creating that relationship, I think, with them um, rather than fearing them. It's working with them. Yeah, I remember when HMV went down and everyone was like, oh, it's the death of the high street. And it's like, they just didn't adapt. Yeah. And it seems like, uh, well, obviously, uh, Random House and Ebreed, they're, they're moving. And a lot, I mean, it's easier to put, I imagine anyway, it'd be easier to put a digital book out than a physical one simply due to logistics of moving physical books and getting them to the right places and getting them in bookshops that have limited space. Do you think digital books are ever going to, like, outsell physical books or are they already kind of doing that? 
Um, I don't think so. I think there was a time when everyone thought that, that digital would kind of be the death of physical, but actually there are so many people out there who still love to own that physical product. And um, I, you know, I haven't noticed really um, much of a decline in um, physical sales. If anything, it seems to be on the up again. Um, which is fantastic and um, I just think they kind of complement each other there are people out there who love to read digital books and then there are people who want to physically kind of own something and Mm. and the 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 touch and feel of a book is is important to them yeah no I know that feeling I I like I like having a physical of some book but I also like want to read some on the train I don't want to carry one with me yeah exactly so you know and again that's another thing was you can kind of flitter between the two whichever you feel is kind of you know owning something like for example I have a Darcy Bustle picture book that (laughs) I just absolutely love Mm. and um, wouldn't want that in any other format and then you know there are books that are cheap and cheerful I think oh this is great (laughs) for a, a ride on the tube so exactly the same thing as you really yeah i think it's i think it's just meeting your audience where they are in the content they wanted in yeah really yeah and i think a lot of people don't think about it they just go oh, i want a book out yeah and you're like do, does your audience read physical books or or do they listen to audio books on audible or whatever yeah do you know what i mean how, yeah. how when you when you're researching an audience because obviously um you were saying before that you have kind of a what was the name of the the like you said there was so we've got a consumer insight team that's the one yeah yes, yeah you, you have a target market you're going after what happens when you find out for example if you release the book as a physical book and not as an audio book and there's demand for it as an audio book how are you are you quite quick to adjust to stuff like that yeah or? yeah I think I think we would be but also we we do tend to release both physical and digital books um right. and usually at the same time unless there's a really kind of particular book where you know it's just not going to work as an ebook um but even then we tend to always kind of adapt you know, most books even kind of gift mm. and humor get adapted um yeah. which you think would be probably mostly um a christmas purchase that you you know want to give to your your mum or dad that's a funny funny book um but we still have them out there as as ebooks and um you know we've got a great audio team here who take some of our books and turn them into audio books but if there's you know if we see there's a demand for something then uh, penguin random house are fantastic at being kind of ready to react very quickly mm. um i know that they published jamal edwards's book in an ebook originally and I think it did phenomenally well. And and then they made a physical book after that. So that was a slightly different way of working. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was to, to meet the demand, really, of, of people actually wanting it in physical. So. Cool. And how do, how do you gauge that demand? Because do, do you have, like, a consumer web bit on your website? It's like register here when the book comes out in physical or is it okay <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm not, home. not I'm sure, no, sure <laughs> about that no, uh, no, in my whole editorial world I don't always know what's going on in, in, in other departments but um, you know we I from from what I understand we've got kind of lots of kind of um, teams within like the whole structure of Pen- Penguin Random House whose job it is to look at all these mm. um, different areas so they'll solely be looking at digital mm. and we have the audio team and then we have the consumer insight team and they all feed down into the mm. separate imprint so um, we're mm. very lucky and Penguin Random House is such an amazing uh, company in that respect um, mm. and in lots of other respects but t- to be able to have that insight from people within your own team um, is 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 brilliant for us and that's how we're able to kind of adapt and, and move quickly on different things mm. um, I have a lot of friends who want to self-publish a book or they want to get a book published and they're looking at self-publishing how uh, well first of all how would you describe your role to someone who doesn't know what a co- like a commissioner does yeah um, <laughs> so I'd say that um, my job is to look for new authors and to think about new books mm. so as I say, so with with autobiographies, for example, you are looking for authors or a talent who wants to write about their life. Mm. But with the gift and humour books, sometimes I'm just looking for something that's funny and maybe picture-led, um, in which case it's not really about the author, it's about the concept. Um, but whatever it is, it is, we're looking, I'm always looking for that new thing to publish. Um, and it's my job to find these things and to get the backing of the rest of the team to, mm. to move them forward and to create whatever book product that will be at the end. Um, and 
my job as an editor as well is to also um, take care of our authors, I guess, and make sure they have the best opportunity to publish the best thing that they can. Um, so whether it's offering editorial um, feedback on the structure, on, on whether you're exploring characters in the right way or whether you know um certain bits are lacking and it's not quite pacey enough you know even in kind of non-fiction it's still in in, in an autobiography it's still important to think Mm. about these things um and and also we have professional copy editors who will work with um with me and the author professional proofreaders as i say if it's required books get read by a lawyer to ensure that they should be safe to publish um and it's all these services really that you don't Mm. tend to get um with um self-publishing or you have to pay for them and as Mm. i say um the company absorbs those costs um and also it's 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 more than that you know we're supported by a really brilliant marketing team a really fantastic publicity team and then the sales team who have connections with all the high street retailers um whether that's waterstones or or bookshops sorry shops like urban outfitters or joy that Mm. stock books um to the completely kind of untraditional places you know um weird kind of galleries and things like that and you don't have that same um uh, ability to talk to these people if you self-publish mm. and to know who you know who is a good copy editor out there unless you're recommended and mm. I know that some people who self-publish perhaps don't even pay for that service and I think to really get the best out of your writing you need to invest in these people who help to bring your book to life yeah it's a collaborative effort even though yes. it's your idea if that makes yeah. sense yeah yeah as, as someone who's trying to self-publish a book at the moment, I get that because I've just had to try and find myself a copy editor, and yeah. it's not hu- easy. No, <laughs> and 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 if you're not familiar with the Sorry. fees or you know, yeah. uh, you know all those things, and whether what they're doing is the thing that mm. needs to be done, there's a lot of trust there, I guess, when you're self-publishing that you, you're, you know, paying a professional to do something and making sure they're they're doing it right. But that being said, you know, as I say, lots some people's self-published books do really well and um you know they know often know their market and they know who they're aiming for Mm. and they go ahead and they're all you know successful at doing it but i i you know um i know i'm on the inside but i do strongly believe that publishers bring so much more to um to somebody's book than if you self-published um but I totally get why people do self-publish and see absolutely nothing wrong with it mm. at all. No, I personally, I'm as someone who I've been published professionally and I'm self-publishing this one. And having seen both sides of it, I know exactly what they offer from your end. Yeah. Uh, but it's a case of I think it's a case of also finding the right publisher. Absolutely. Because like you could just like with my first book, I just got offered a publishing deal and I thought oh, I'll go with that then because yeah. they're a big publisher and and it's it's gone quite well. But you you sort of I always think maybe I should have looked around yes, or, ta- or yeah. take an extra minute or something. I mean, how would you even, if, if you're someone who's written a book and you don't even know where to start looking for a publisher or an agent, if you yeah. know you guys won't touch an agent, how would you even start looking for something like that? Um, there's this amazing book called The Writers and Artists <laughs> Hamburg. Yeah. Do you yeah, have I it? Have that book. Yes, I have that book. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. just go into Waterstones and take some, some notes down. No, I'm mm. joking. Um, it's fantastic. And, you know, it details lots of the publishing houses, lots of the agents who are out there and tells you the best ways of kind of structuring your proposals mm. and, and such like I believe mm. um, it doesn't have that as much okay. but yeah but it, ha- it has their details and it has what they do it has what they do and where they are in the structure of the of the organisation okay. and, and their number usually but not their extension number <laughs> which yeah. is a little bit annoying because <laughs> um, you're sort of like, oh, that would have been nice um, yes but yeah, yeah. Um, and I just say definitely reading that is probably a good place to start I would I would Google some of these kind of places and see what they do because because as well the most important thing is to find someone who can represent your work mm. um, and understands what you're doing. You know you, you you're very right in that you have to find the right publisher and you have to find the right agent. You know it can make or break a book probably, mm. and if they don't, if the publisher doesn't quite understand your vision and 
the agent doesn't quite know who to pitch you to you know you could kind of really lose out I guess mm. so it's it is important to take your time and or you know often agents will um, bring their authors to publishing houses to meet their editors to ensure that they're you know there is that kind of understanding about Mm. how it works and and that you get on with your publisher and that the books that they publish are the things that you know you um would feel passionately about and you can see what they kind of stand for yeah totally yeah i know what you mean i mean when i when i was looking for stuff i basically looked at amazon to find other books that were similar yeah. to try and find it that way and i found that really useful yeah um, and also going into the front couple of pages of a, of a book that is like that and finding who they've dedicated to oh, generally yes. yeah because yeah. there's sort of that page i don't know what that page is called but the page before the dedication where it says who's done everything yes yeah the imprint page is, is it called the imprint page, page? okay yeah yeah I should have done more, <laughs> have done more i just stopped at uh slush <laughs> but yeah i know what you mean it's just a really interesting page anyway because you find you find there's a lot of crossover because i assume especially with like uh you all have individual commissions that you do so you probably you deal with humor books and gift books and stuff which means that lots of those are going to be attributed to you if that makes sense yes, eventually if yeah. the name keeps coming up you go Oh. Yeah, exactly, and and that's that's really right. You can do the Amazon search inside as well for kind of in the acknowledgements page mm. and, and find you know type in commissioning editor, and you might find the name of the person you actually do want to reach mm. if it's in that book, and you know that that's the kind of thing that your book is similar to, um, definitely. And and yeah, sometimes you can find out a lot actually from the acknowledgements page or the imprint page about mm. who's um, been publishing what. <laughs> And then, and then start Googling them and yeah, finding yeah, yeah, out yeah, yeah. <laughs> their email addresses and such like. Yeah, it's like your version of LinkedIn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just, oh, that's my friend. Um, and uh, to get noticed then by, let's say, Ebury Random House, if you didn't have an agent, um, obviously you said that you spend a lot of time on the internet um, pr- productively uh, f- finding uh, like the hottest and, and most interesting stuff. But... You obviously, literally, the amount of stuff on the internet, you can't see everything. No. Like, I mean, I've tried to watch every cat video. It's just, it's <laughs> just not possible. I will do it. Um, but I've got to do these. But, yeah, but I mean, so uh, on the hypothetical that you have missed this, ge- like, say someone's listening and they've got a gem of an idea and for, for whatever reason you've missed it, what is a good way of getting noticed without sending you a copy and going, please read it? Um, Gosh, that's a difficult question. I'm trying to think about if it was the other way around and I was trying to get noticed by me, <laughs> what I would do. Um, Send a chocolate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love chocolate. Yeah. What's your um, favourite chocolate? No, I'm I'm easily bribed. So, um, <laughs> but not the other two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I would just keep working really hard at building up uh, your fan base I guess Mm. Um, and I you know I have been sent um, some things unsolicited that I do look at and um, sometimes you know there is a gem in there and I try and get back to everybody but obviously we don't actively encourage people to keep submitting things to us (laughs) Um, but you know so what I've noticed with some things um, for example um, I'll just use the dog gift and humour book as, mm. as one. Um, Doug the Pug, which we're not publishing, but um, oh. is is amazing and I wish we were. <laughs> um, he uh, uh, His owner um, quit her job and just started working on this full time. And she got in touch with loads of people. She was contacting people on like BuzzFeed and Mashable mm. and, and just hoping to kind of raise the profile of, of Doug. And then eventually, obviously, everyone cottoned onto it mm. and, and suddenly publishers were kind of interested in what mm. Doug was up to yeah. and whether he could um, do a book. I mean, obviously, with narrative books, that's a lot harder and, I, yeah. you know, that's not going to work. Um, and I guess, um, you know, it is just kind of, kind of keep plugging away as I said sometimes the self-published ones do get noticed by Mm. um, publishers and we're suddenly like oh you know this is like working really well and you know and then they're interested in acquiring the rights from you so Mm. you know um, but otherwise I'm you know as I say it's usually through agents that we get sent stuff unless I've noticed them um, in whatever way through reading newspapers or 
looking online or listening to what my nieces and nephews are, are up to and and Don't researching. Everyone will email your niece and, and, <laughs> niece and, niece and nephew. nephew. Yeah. Go, Could you just read my book? It's really funny. It's, 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 Doug, it's Doug the Pugette. I don't know. That'd be amazing. Um, yeah, for those who don't know, Doug the Pug is an amazing Facebook page with a pug on it called Doug. It sounds yeah. rubbish when you describe yeah. it, doesn't it? Yeah, but he's, he's, he's amazing. truly amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, well, he's not. His owner is. Doug has probably no idea what's going on. Yeah, he's probably clueless. He's like, <laughs> he's like why are you putting this, this outfit on me again? <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, you know, things like that are really successful. You yeah. republished the, the Meerkat books, actually. Um, for Compare the for, Market. Yeah, 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 and they were kind of a gift and humour book. Mm. And, th- th- you know, they sold really really well um so if you own an animal and it's got a good <laughs> social media presence you know seek me out <laughs> find me on twitter um you know um <clears throat> but yeah i mean but, ov- but obviously we do concentrate on the mm. good narrative stories mm. um and proper sensible books um and not, not just just pugs <laughs> yes. yeah you should have a pug department that'd be amazing <laughs> yeah maybe a whole like animal department that'd be amazing <laughs> <laughs> um i can see the range now I'm gonna i am that. doing another book called uh, oh. amber's donkey uh which is <laughs> <laughs> but it's not about well it is, is it about a, don- a donkey but right. it's a proper kind of real life story it's really very oh, heartwarming okay. and um i seem to be building this kind of list of animals so uh, yeah. <laughs> i've got a dog book coming out as well um that's a narrative <laughs> book and another kind of real life story so yeah it's really turning into kind of like ebris farm <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing and it was i mean uh, the book titles just like they, they are they're not becoming the clickbait of books but they are the thing that first it grabs you yeah and then obviously the book cover what part do you play in like book titles and things because you know if, if an author comes to you with a great idea for a book but the title is maybe not as sellable as i'm trying to be tactful about yes. it but you know w- at what point i mean do you have like a meeting about it and say you know this is this is not good. I mean, you, yes. Yeah. yeah no. You're making a very awkward face. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, because I think it's important to be honest in these situations. Mm. You know, um, publishers have seen what works. They've seen what doesn't work. Mm. And and you know, sometimes um, there's there's a formula to kind of nailing a title. And you know that with a certain word it does you know better or whatever and you know we 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 talk to the author about it and obviously be very sensitive to it because you Mm. know often authors are kind of you know uh, they think they have the whole package and that's you know in their mind that that's what it was going to be published as and you know we try and show them other books within their their genre that have worked and not worked and um you know we you know and, and sometimes you know we're wrong (laughs) <laughs> and you know th- their title is actually brilliant and um sales this team sometimes run it past retailers to see you know which title is better and we get that kind of feedback too mm. um and um you know we sometimes dream up titles for the books and, and put them to our authors and and kind of suggest them and then there are ones where you wouldn't imagine that the title would be brilliant but actually it, it works and it's fantastic and yeah, I know what you mean. Sometimes you have to just go with your gut on it, yes, really. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what's, well, what is, I've got to ask, because everyone will ask me why I didn't ask, what's your formula for book titles then? Or is it not as <laughs> linear as God, that? Yeah, I think it just, it depends what kind of book you're publishing. Um, as I say, you know, sometimes we have got it wrong and, you know, mm. from, you know, I can't think of a title off the top of my head, <laughs> and I won't name and unshame. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, probably not. A good idea. Send but, this through legal. <laughs> yeah, um, but they, yeah, there's no real formula, but you you do tend to kind of look at the market and look at what other books are published within that genre, and mm. you you know obviously reading the manuscript really kind of um, gives you a good idea of what title could mm. go with that book. Um, and the subtitles are often also just as important because mm. they're the, they're the one line pitch to the reader that's going to either hook them in or not. So mm. sometimes the title and the subtitle kind of complement each other on yeah. the cover. Um, but there's there's no formula as such. It's just a case of really getting to know the manuscript and the, the author's work, and also um, seeing what other titles have worked within that genre. Yeah.
when it comes to sort of eye catching book covers, because mm-hmm. obviously that's the next thing that yeah. people. I, I, why well, she is it? I mean, because for me, when I'm browsing, I tend to go to Amazon and I, I type in, you know, sort of roughly what I want if I don't know what yeah. book I'm after specifically, and then I'll read titles yeah. and then I'll look at covers yeah. because it's not people you kind of you know with people I think you get attracted to faces and that kind of stuff whereas with covers unless there's a you know recognizable thing on it yeah is that consumer right I mean or am I or is that just how I deal with it um (laughs) there's probably a mixture of people actually Mm. but I think that what what you're doing as in going on Amazon and typing in some keywords and hoping to see a list of Mm. books that um uh, you know are trying to grab your attention and you hope that 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 they're kind of going to you know answer what you want them to answer and be Mm. the book you want them to be so so it's a mixture of things really um the title is key but as you say the cover is also key we now always think about what that's going to look like on on um on websites (laughs) yeah because it's tiny tiny, and you know it has to still have an impact and you're Mm. competing on a page with you know it might show 50 or 20 other books and you're trying to make your stand out the most so it's a mixture of a really good title and a a cover that's eye-catching that you know looks like it's it's the real deal yeah totally and it's and it's going to be worth your money over another book that's showing on that page um yeah yeah, I mean, I, I'm a comedian by night, and I do uh, a lot of festivals, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of them now have their own websites for, you know, listings and stuff, and the the image is roughly the same size, and, and always they say, just don't put any text on it, because right. no one's going to be able to read that, yeah. and, and, you know, it's true, because when you look at book covers, I mean, although they're, oh, sorry, I, no one else can see <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, like, show with my fingers the size of a, a square I don't know why <laughs> uh, but it's like a rectangular yeah. so so you know you'd think it would fit more but it just you can't read it no and and I've, I've got a designer for my book at the moment and we're having these discussions where we're like if we make the font bigger would that a good idea yeah but then I'm like why do I the title's there why would I need the do you know what I mean and yeah. it's, it's like a weird conversation you have to have mm-hmm. where you're like the title's there why do I need the title again in the book cover but then when they open it it's going to be bigger exactly so yeah. yeah I can imagine you guys having a horrible time yeah I mean we 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 do take it into consideration but obviously the end product of the book is probably more important more important than what it looks like online but but it is definitely a massive consideration Mm. for us um and actually we have a book coming out called why fonts matter um so it might be worth taking a look at that yeah when it comes out um I'm a big font geek so I'm probably gonna love that yeah Yeah. I'm probably gonna love Um, that um so totally worth uh, investing in a book like that to kind of Mm. you know especially if you're half designing your own cover and looking <laughs> for uh, inspiration and, and it's such like it's more the designer that's doing the work <laughs> I've just said this is it's called how to make a living by working for free do here's a copy of it read it yeah come back to me with some <laughs> ideas because I don't know I was going to use uh, do you know 32designs.com it's like a website where you submit your idea to them and then uh, crowdsource ideas from different designers oh, amazing and then you only pay for the one that you use yeah which is really useful and cool but I you know this designer, so I've used them for years, so I thought I'd yeah. go with them. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll link it to that later. Yeah, um, that sounds like a fantastic website. I love all of this, the, the kind of new way of, of working on things. Yeah. And um, to know that you can kind of reach out to, to a, a designer and mm. if they're the right person for you, then you found them through this kind of unique website. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, the, the eight book that I read um, really gave me like a resource list of, you know, but basically it was a lot of the Amazon products, but it had like a resource list of other things that were great, that, like, that really helped me find like an editor and helped me find the designer. And and as someone who, like when, when I had my first book come out, I was very detached from the process. They they sort of offered me a publishing deal. Yeah. Very. I don't. Okay, I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. You tell me if this is normal because I don't think it's normal. <laughs> okay. And as a result, I'm sort of. I, I don't know how publishing works. If that makes okay. sense. Okay. So I I was writing. F- it was a newspaper, which I won't mention. But I was I was writing for them, and then I told them I have a book idea, and they said, "Oh, come on in. We'll talk about it." Yep. And then we had one meeting, and at the end of the meeting, they said, uh, "Can we have your address? We'll send you a contract." And I said, "Okay." And then they sent me a contract, and then I finished writing it by the date they said. Yep. And then they came back with some edits, and I did the edits, and then next thing I know, it's on their website, and it's on Amazon, and like I haven't done anything. Like they they sent me a couple Cover, they sent me two cover things and I got to pick and they went with the one I didn't want but, but, <laughs> but the, point, the point is, is that it was I just felt so detached from the whole process right. I was like I now don't know how publishing works in yes, any way yeah. all I know is I have a book out <laughs> yeah yeah um that sounds like quite a n- unique experience <laughs> um 
but not too unique that it doesn't you know there's definitely things that we do there that yeah. obviously you've experienced with your publisher um we try and give our authors you know we have this thing uh, at penguin random house called author care and you mm. know f- authors are at the center of what we do you mm. know without them we wouldn't exist um and so you know it's really important for us to make sure that they feel fully involved in the whole process Mm. um and so from from the cover design to kind of the final thing that is produced um we involve them along every step of that um even if it's a case of you know we sit down and brief the covers we'll still share with them our thoughts and feelings and then you know land on something and there's that whole kind of you know we want authors feedback um but there's that trust issue as well that if Mm. if we really feel strongly about something we try to show the author why we think it's not quite what they want or Mm. but 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 likewise we'll listen to them if they really feel like they know their audience and Mm. this will you know work for them then we take that on board too um and as I say, every step of the way, you know, whether it's seeing the proof, the final kind of typeset, so you can proofread mm. it for one last time, it doesn't sound like Didn't you know. had that. No. Yeah. Well, I, I, I wanted that because I, I had a way that I wanted certain, like, sort of pull out bits and, and tips and stuff. It, yeah. was, it was like a how-to guide. So I wanted, I wanted it to be laid out a certain way. But they have. Well, the the thing was, was that originally it got picked up as a as just an individual book, and then they brought out like sort of five or six books in like a series okay. that was to do with that, and so they wanted them all to be standardised, yeah. uh, which I didn't get a say in again. Right. But I was fine with it. Like I didn't yeah. sort of kick up a fuss and go, oh, how dare you publish yeah. my book in the way you want to? You're doing a lot of the work, <laughs> damn it. But it was still. It, it, I just didn't like how detached I was from the whole process yeah. because. I, I wanted the experience of going through it, if that yes, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, you definitely get that if you were at Ebri. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tweet them in a minute and be annoyed. Um, <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I've, I've only worked um, at Ebri and I've only worked at one other publishers, which was mm. John Blake Publishing. And they had the same kind of outlook there that you involve your author every every step of the way and, mm. and kind of really take care of them, make them feel involved. I mean, this is their work ultimately mm. and you're just helping to kind of put it out there and, and make it the best it can be. And so it's important, I think, for authors to be involved in every step of the way. So I don't know about how other publishers might work. You know, some of them perhaps feel that once the manuscript's delivered that the author's kind of job is maybe done Mm, um i don't know but um but as i say without authors publishers wouldn't exist so uh (laughs) you're important and um you should be involved Mm. and with i mean obviously it's because that because that brings up an interesting question then like you guys need us or as writers you need up writers because otherwise you have nothing to sell or nothing to work on and we obviously need you because well, I mean, we could self-publish, but we do need you ultimately because you provide a lot of value and a lot more, I, mean, I don't want to say credibility, but you provide a lot more clout, should we say, mm-hmm. than we could possibly do on our own. Yeah. So when, you, when you're taking on a contract with someone or a relationship with someone, do you see it as like a working relationship or do you see it as like a, how is it viewed for you guys? Um, what do you mean? Because well, you're kind of, because you are working together yes. as a team, as yeah. it were. But do they? Do you see it as they're working for Random House, or do you see it as they're independent people that you're contracting in for a book? Like, how is that seen? Oh, I've not really thought about <laughs> kind of how it's seen. Um, for me, it's I. I think it's just a collaboration. Actually, you know, we're helping them, and they're helping us, and together we're creating something. Mm. And um, I don't, you know, obviously it's a working relationship, mm. um, but it's, you both have the same goal, which is to sell books and to reach people and to open people's minds to, to new ideas and that mm. kind of thing. So for me, it's just a, a collaboration, both with the same goal and mm. ultimately, and um, to get to that goal, it's just about working together. Mm. Um and supporting each other I think mm. a big uh, thing that's probably well, that I think in moving in books or not in books in just the publishing world is additional content on top of the book itself yeah. so you know like snippets of stuff that didn't make it in yeah. blogging around the book uh, maybe even podcasting whatever yeah. it may be 
what's uh, E.B. Radham House's take on that and where do you see that affecting the future of the industry? Um, I think that it's all incredibly important. I think we need to stay um, agile. I think that um, those kind of additional content things that, that you mentioned, um, we see more as kind of a marketing tool, I think. Mm. Um, and it is about staying relevant. You know, we did so many incredible things with the Dan and Phil book that, um, you know, we had a teaser trailer that was a bit like a film trailer and mm. it just kind of, um, all the fans were saying that they'd Beyonce'd um, them because they just released it and mm. there was kind of no hint that they were working on this book, even though it had been signed up for a, a lot longer than when we mm. when they announced it. And then we did an audio um, trailer as well, which used this incredible stuff where it sounds like they're in the room with you. It's like, <laughs> I, I don't know what it's called, I forget, but it's Immersive. it's perhaps yeah, okay. um, yeah. and um, yeah all the sounds they were creating and stuff or mm. it was so you, you were there with them and it was um, really great and then you know as uh, releasing sh- sort of videos of, of behind the scenes the making of but all these things um, we see as, as really important mm. um, you know um, this is a world we live in now you know everything's kind of available and consumed quite quickly Mm. and um you know we want to reach as wide an audience as possible but it's also about finding and marketing things in the right way because there's no Mm. point in putting a video out there for a book that that audience just aren't looking Mm. for that content so it's about being wise as well about kind of what you're doing in and around that book and who Mm. you're talking to and obviously you want some things to break out to a wider Mm. audience or to a new audience um but it's still about being clever and and how you how you're doing that um but i'm all for it i absolutely love it i think it's i think it's it's great to have more than just a book out there and um, you know, with Dan and Phil, we took them um, on tour in the end, and it mm. was kind of more than just a book tour. It was a kind of theatrical mm. um, big performance, and they were in the Palladium, and they were travelling around the UK, and, um, you know, we were able to help bring that alive. Mm. Um, and that's really unique and special, and it was really exciting. And I think what's brilliant about Penguin is um, that we're so big, but we've got so much um, sort of experience within the building that... You know, we've got teams that are, are looking into all this and, and mm. working on these these great campaigns, and we have the ability to react quite quickly. Um, but you know, as with any industry, it's about keeping up and mm. um, yeah, seeing the opportunities and and thinking about them in the right way that you're targeting people. Um, yeah, in the right way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I've noticed more and more books are having trailers to them. Which, yeah. uh, in particular, I remember Tim Ferriss, if you know him, he had a really interesting trailer for The 4-Hour Body, mm-hmm. um, which was like, just a, it, just, it felt like a cinema trailer, which which I thought was an interesting move for that. Yeah. Because it just, i I just not seen that before, really. Yeah. And he had an interesting point about um, the reason why he went with Amazon over, over a traditional publisher, where he said that um, he found that, like, the, after the book was released, you sort of get a couple of months of support in marketing, and after that, they sort of leave you to it, because mm-hmm. obviously you have to deal with other books. How how true is that, and is it a case of just because that's the burst period of when people are buying it, it makes sense not to continuously promote it forever because it's going to reach saturation point and no one's going to no one's going to need it who hasn't already bought it. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, this is a slightly harder question for me to answer because I'm not in the kind of the marketing world, but. Mm. Um, you know, from from what I can see, I think you know. Obviously, when a book is first published, there's a bigger push mm. um, on all fronts, mm. um, and then you know, but but we do continue to kind of support things throughout the year, throughout its time. You know, if opportunities arise and we see them, you know, and that's what we call kind of the backlist books. Those that every year still are selling copies mm. that are really quite old books like um how to win friends and influence people you know yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. so you know that that's a backlist book that just kind of keeps on going and if there's an opportunity to kind of remarket it to a new audience or um you know it's it's some kind of special event somewhere that we Mm. can promote again this book then then we do do it so you know it's it's seeing the opportunities but you can't possibly keep marketing so you know we publish so many books 
but if we see the opportunities we still continue to s- support them and um you know what Ibrig are looking at at the moment to kind of different ways of of supporting authors um that are either through events or through talks or you know um that can continue to be a proper kind of partnership rather than just a one-off book product although that it all kind of centers around the book so um which is again another really great way of kind of working and not just seeing a book as a book mm. but as as kind of a 360 thing i think mm. how many books do you publish a year do you have like a minimum quota that you need to because obviously you need to produce a certain number of yeah but, but obviously if there's not any good ones to I mean, obviously will, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like if, yes. if, for example, you had no new ones you wanted to promote this month, but you had 20 the next month or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, I think um, th- there are definitely kind of numbers that we have to hit in terms of how many books we publish mm. or thereabouts, you know, there's an idea and a forecast yeah. and, um, you know, uh, our sales team will always look at each book and schedule it in the right month and make sure that not all our books are publishing in may for example and then for the rest of the year it's very quiet (laughs) um but um that as far as i'm concerned as an editor i have kind of a rough idea of how many books i should Mm. be looking to acquire but you know it it varies and it depends and it's all about the quality not Mm. about the quantity um and i think that's kind of the the same for the whole kind of group that mm. it's just about finding the good writers mm. the good um you know the, the good talent that's out there and um you know i don't have p- specific numbers i mm. don't know what they are but obviously they exist in mm. some some way or another and and from the day that you sort of have got well for, let's do it this way from the day you found a thing you want to publish to the day it comes out, either in Kindle or well, that's, let's say ebook, because otherwise <laughs> yeah. it's getting promoted for them. Um, ebook slash physical slash audio. How long does that? I mean, is because obviously you said there's a step by step process, yeah. and obviously you might want to have it out at a certain time of the year. But to to get to the stage where it's ready to go out, even if like you have it planned for three months ahead of when yeah. it's ready, how long does that on average take? Um. I mean, honestly, it really depends when we want to publish and when it delivers. Okay. But we can turn books around really quickly. Right. So, uh, you know, if it's important that it's out in May, but the author's delivered in November, then it just means you have to work extra hard to uh, do the structural edit, do the copy edit, the proofread and the legal read and the typesetting and just kind of sort of fit it into a couple of months as opposed Mm. to you know having more time to do it but then you know some books are a year in the work some are longer um and it also depends on the author as well and how long they feel they need to write the book Mm. um with some books obviously there's better time of year to publish them so we try and use that Mm. to kind of roughly have an idea and um when books go to print there's kind of a time between anyway Mm. um between them going to print and then publishing Mm. just to allow printers to get the volumes done so um honestly it's really hard for me to say but we've turned books around in a very very short space of time (laughs) um that's been very stressful and (laughs) uh and also ones that have just kind of you know took a lot longer to, Mm. to get there so yeah no, no, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, and for for you do gift humor and non-fiction. So, what are the best times of year for those? Because obviously, as you said, they're going to be seasonal things. They're going to be different. Yeah. Mm. So for um, gift and humor, usually Christmas time is a good time. Um, <laughs> you know, gifting is also happening during this time. So, um, but you know, some books that we've published, we published kind of. September time and they've just kind of as I say it's kind of like ticking over nicely mm. and then come Christmas you see a kind of spike as more people are purchasing them as, mm. as gifts and you know Father's Day or Mother's Day are, mm. are kind of good times for certain books because again yeah. it's gifting time um, but for other books that I do like the narrative non-fiction like the real life stories or um, you know whether it's kind of a fashion book or, or whatever it is um it just depends if there's kind of a good time in terms of publicity for when there might be an anniversary for something for example i published the last british dambuster which was um johnny johnson's memoir and it's it's a fantastic story 
and you know his life story it's amazing and we published that in time for the dam's anniversary mm. um which was in may so um like I say, if there's kind of a good time for it to kind of launch, um, and we try and time it around that, but otherwise it's it's a mixture of finding out how long the author needs and yeah. when a good time for it to be put out there by us, um, and then finding that sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, like avoiding other books. That are out, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you collaborate with other publishing houses to make sure that you don't clash too much with... Oh, okay. No, we don't know what they're up to. Um, no, it just, it, I just thought it makes sense for you all to be on the same yeah, page. That's not meant to sound like <laughs> a pun. Um, but no, yeah. um, you know, and obviously at, at certain times of year, like Christmas, we have the, the Super Thursdays um, mm. that are in October, and I think they're the second and third weeks in October. Mm. And that's when all the kind of big books come out or what are considered the big books so you get mm. celebrity autobiographies and that kind of thing at that time of year mm. and everyone comes out so you'll have you know we had um dan and phil come out and also the dell boy spoof autobiography and then you know uh, another publisher had uh steven gerrard come out so you know it's it's yeah. a case of we fight it out <laughs> and try and reach our audiences and um yeah, sometimes you've got two people competing that are after a similar kind of market and uh, mm. and you hope that that reader will come to, to your book, but mm. you never know. Yeah, <laughs> I, have, I have some, they're quick fire for me, take as long as you'd like to answer, yeah. is what I'm going to say. These are from other authors who have gone through a process of getting a book published, but haven't had the things answered they want to mm-hmm. ask. Um, and this is specific, obviously, for, uh, e- well, you can do it either for... Random House or is it Blake Publi- uh, my old, the company John Blake Publishing yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you look for uh, sorry, uh, what is it to look out for in a contract with a publisher is it always best to do a deal where it's commission is paid or, or sales or a one off fee oh, um, I think it actually depends on the type of book you're publishing and what kind of suits you and that book um, there's no real kind of uh, answer to that question um, I'm afraid Sorry. Uh, yeah. I mean I think perhaps in an ideal scenario you want the, the advance and you want royalties um, which is um, you know probably a standard way of publishing putting contracts out there but again a flat fee if it's kind of just a, a one off service that, mm. and they've perhaps asked you to write this said book that's mm. quite common as well um, ghost writers usually get a flat fee as opposed to kind of the, the, the royalty advance um, way of working um, it really it really does depend I'm afraid there's no kind of okay. proper answer for that one it's not my question you don't <laughs> have to apologise to me they will probably tweet you though um, <laughs> no, no. it's fine I won't include your Twitter um, what's the process for getting books translated and selling them overseas is it I like this question but I wish I'd written it but it's kind of cute um, do you need to get a book translated into American if it's written in English um, no but they might Americanize. Um, the book for you so while we might have written mum they might change it to mom and Mm. certain words just don't work over there they've got no idea what it is Mm. so they will change it to suit um, their kind of way of talking Mm. Um, we have a rights team here so if we buy world or languages then we will sell or try to get other publishers around the world to buy rights to your book so we might approach German publishers um, and they then offer an advance to publish in German. And obviously that's all done eventually. It filters to the author because there's mm. the royalty rates in there mm. as well. Um, and, you know, um, that's a big goal of ours is to, to try and get the book around the world. Um, we do also have an export team. Um, so even if another publisher hasn't um, bought the rights to it, you might find that they'll export into Australia or mm. Singapore um, and your book will be out there, but it'll be out there in English um, mm. rather than in, in whatever language it is that that country speaks. Um, I think, was that everything? That's everything. <laughs> um, for ebooks, is there any way of tracking where sales are coming from and uh, sometimes if you get a short spurt in sales, uh, like, you know, how are you monitoring where those are coming from and whether they're referrals or...? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, uh, as I say, we have teams, a digital team here who look after the whole of Penguin Random House. Mm. 
Um, we have a, a, de- a you know person here um, on Ebru floor who's in the digital team, but um, I we're only ever kind of shared the most important information. And I think if if we were to ask them, oh, do you know why there was a spike in this? <coughs> they would probably have that data for us, but it's not something that, uh, as a commissioning editor, I'm focused on looking at kind of all that kind of insight. We usually get kind of presentations from them um, where they feed back on certain things. And we know if a book, for example, if the cost was reduced and then suddenly, you you know, the, the sales have gone up, they'll mm. tell us, oh, it's because your book, the book came down in price. Mm. Um, or, you know, the, our publicity team will send us around a newsletter when we know, um, letting us know when certain things are happening. So we'll know mm. that, say, if an author goes on this morning and suddenly you realise your pre-orders have gone up by, you know, however many copies, then it probably is because of that Mm. um so uh, there is that insight i'm sure but on a day-to-day basis i don't have access or kind of i'm not told of that information okay um how much control does an author get over the price of the book and are there any best practices on creating special offers giveaways or pricing a book um most books within most genres have a certain selling price so for example real life stories that are sold in the supermarkets tend to be priced around 6.99 7.99 um and it really is a case of kind of working out roughly what you think that that, that the reader will pay for your book mm. um but as i say we do have a rough idea and obviously there's feedback from retailers as well as to kind of you know price points on things so um it's that again it's quite a difficult one depending on the book and uh, you know i mean in this instance i'd say trust your publisher if they've said the price should be x then i'd say they've probably had some really good insight to know Mm. that it should be that price yeah totally and if if you're self-publishing i'd probably look at other books that that are similar to what you're publishing and see what your competitors are are pricing their book mm. and even in even big publishing houses to see um but i i do know often self people who self-publish tend to kind of lower their price point because you are competing with so many other kind mm. of people out there mm. um what hap- what happens if you pay an author in advance and they miss the deadline do they have to pay it back or do you cancel the book what's the process um it depends by how long they miss the deadline. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean... They, don't, they haven't specified uh, if yeah, they've missed okay. a deadline. Well, if, if, if you think you can't make it, and uh, but you think you need an extra month or two, then, you know, there's always mm. that room for us to, to kind of explore. And, you know, if it's a case of something, you know, it's best that the book is right. And, you know, unless it's really, really time sensitive to publishing at a certain time and you're going to totally miss that that time then i'd say that publishers are really keen to just make sure the book is the best it can be and they'll push it back and they'll work Mm. with the author to make sure that everything is um as it should be and that they can still publish their book okay are writers ever employed by random house or do you only ever buy the rights to the book um so yes we do employ writers so um sometimes as i say i might have an idea and i'm looking for a writer to actually execute it and which is quite often as i say because i often go out looking for things or i notice things Mm. that are happening i'm like oh i really want someone who kind of works in a forest and works with wood (laughs) and that you know he's escaped kind of the london life or you know the the rat race and he's taken himself out there Mm. and he's kind of uh at one with the world and i'll Mm. be like but I can't find that person and where are they? Um, you know, it could be that someone knows someone and um, you, or, you know, for example, you might um, have an idea and you need a ghostwriter or um, or you've got a humour book and you need someone who's just incredibly funny who can take that topic and, mm. and create a book, in which case we will hire writers to do it. Mm. So it's, it's a mixture between finding authors and then also finding writers who can bring to life the ideas that we have as publishers as well. 
Yeah, you said at John Blake your job was more coming up with ideas for yeah. books and sort of, I think you phrase it, dreaming up ideas. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, telling them to write a book, basically. Yes, yeah. Um, and I'm sure that is a dream job for a lot of, uh, especially comedian and comedy writers mm-hmm. who sort of go, oh, I've got this great idea for a funny pug-based book. Yeah. Um, you know, what is, I mean, obviously you were full-time there. I mean, do they ever freelance people with that? Or is it like, or do they take unsolicited ideas? What's what's the process for that kind of thing? If there you, if you just they have an do. idea but not a book. Yeah, yeah there, there they definitely um, have their slush pile. Because mm. <laughs> I, I used to um, be in charge of that slush pile when I first started out. <laughs> and so it's my job to look through all the submissions. And actually they've, I off the top of my head, I can't think of one, but I know there have been a few gems that have Landed like um, in in the uh, inbox that have become mm. books, and um, you know they they actively encourage that. And sometimes it is an idea, and it isn't mm. necessarily a fully formed proposal. But they mm. just think they've got this idea that they think will work really well, and they want to run it past a publisher without putting in a lot of time and effort into mm. getting something off the ground to then have everyone say, no, this isn't going to work. Yep. Um, and, you know, actually, I'm, I'm really open to that here as well. And um, I really like it when we kind of dream up these ideas mm. and they become book projects. And, you know, I love to hear from people if they've got ideas and they want to run it past us first to see if it is something that we would publish. Because sometimes, mm. you you know you're sitting on something you're like I know people would want to read this mm. but I don't have time to kind of put it together now in case publishers yeah. are going to say no yeah um and then you've wasted hours <laughs> of your time um and not got that kind of dream deal but um so I'm very open to hearing from people if they've got ideas that they want mm. to kind of turn into something and I think agents really uh, sometimes not all of them <laughs> like that too because yeah. um it just gives them something to work with and you know they're they're kind of you know surrounded by really creative people and authors mm. as well so they're they're really great at kind of coming up with the mm. the book or turning it into something more than just kind of an idea how i mean uh, i i was talking to a couple of literary agents recently and they said uh for non-fiction they tend to want the first couple of chapters and then for fiction books they tend to want the whole thing because uh, <laughs> I think one of them just said if I start that book and I like it and you haven't sent me the whole thing I'm going to be mad <laughs> like, I'm going to be really frustrated that you've given me the first you know and I have to email yeah. you back for it I mean is that the same here like do you uh, well you, you deal with humour books so I yes. presume you'd want the whole well for narrative books I presume you want the whole thing I tell you, you answer that question. Yeah. You know what I'm asking. Um, yeah. For actually, um, I I really do kind of a whole mixture. So although we, I do do a lot of humour, there there's a lot of kind of really kind of sensible narrative books on my list. Like I say, like the Last British Dambuster and some of the real life stories. Um, I've got a really great book coming out called Control Alt Delete next year. Oh, um, yes, that's a good title. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, it's kind of a, a memoir of growing up online th- with the internet. Oh, so. Right. Um, not just humor i've got mm. a kind of a lot of narrative stuff but for me i i personally prefer only um a couple of chapters a mm. synopsis and maybe a breakdown of of mm. what's to come beyond those few sample chapters you've sent me um i you know we don't unless we love something we don't have time to mm. like sit and read a whole manuscript um and it's not possible really. it, yeah there's you know we're try, trying to put books through as well as kind of acquire and um for us it's better to have an idea of of sample writing and a breakdown so the whole arc so mm. you're not just getting half half yeah. a story which yeah um would be awful <laughs> um yeah. and and then if we love it then we'll see if there's more material um for us to read if it's something we really want to to mm. pursue um, but otherwise, if I get sent a whole manuscript and not really an overview, um, I find it really annoying. <laughs> mm. so, so, yeah. Um, how many books does it take to enter the bestseller list? Or, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, uh, how long is a piece of string? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, it, yeah. it depends what time of year. Mm. Um, obviously, Christmas, <laughs> more books are sold. Yeah. Um, and... Um, honestly, it depends what else has come out in that month. It depends, what, you know, what your, yeah, what your competition is. Um, it, there's real no answer to that. It, from month to month, it can vary. Is, um, is there somewhere you can see how many books have been sold by a book? Yes. Yeah, so we, we have a, th- a thing called Nielsen Book Scan, and that right. tells us, um, that gives us data 
um, and data for for all books that have been published, not self-published, but through yeah. through tills. So mm. it wouldn't necessarily be through, for example, Urban Outfitters, but through traditional yeah. like, supermarkets and Smiths and Waterstones. And so we know how many copies books have sold. Mm. Yeah. And it's, that's not publicly available, I presume. No. 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 Okay. Just for my own record. <laughs> um, what are the biggest lessons slash mistakes you've learned or made as a Oh yeah. <laughs> How long um, have you got? <laughs> yeah. um, mistakes. Uh, Maybe if we do them as an author or an idea, f- an idea is generated for an author and as a commissioner. Okay, ask me the question again. Um, well, let's, let's do them individually. Um, what are the biggest mistakes slash lessons you've learnt as an author or ideas generator for an author? Okay. Um, when I was an author. I thought it was really easy to write loads of words and actually found it really quite hard um, to... It's it's such a solitary thing to do, isn't it, writing? And you're on your own yeah. and um, you're in your own thoughts kind of all day. And um, I didn't really realise just how kind of involved it was from the other side. Yeah. So, you know... Um, becoming an author um, uh, and seeing what it's really like for an author made me really appreciate the author even more um, Mm. than what I already did as an editor and when they tell you that they're struggling to hit their deadline they really are and they haven't been doing other things they are just struggling to make their deadline Um, so I became a lot more patient I think um, (laughs) with you know time frames and schedules and that kind of thing and and looking at ways to help the author Um, so that was a lesson learned (laughs) Um, I just trying to think I can't really think of anything that's been so bad that I've thought this is a big mistake uh, in terms of having projects that I've found someone to write or whatever Okay. Mm. Oh, well, we can just stick with lessons then. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. No, I know what you mean. Mistake is probably the wrong word because as long as you learn from it, yes, it can't yeah. be a mistake. Yeah. That's what people say that make lots of mistakes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. And Amazon recently opened a bookshop. I don't know if you were well, yeah, you, you nodded, so you heard about no, that. No, I, oh, I, ha- I don't think I heard about that. Okay. Um, they've opened one in Seattle, like oh, a right. physical bricks and mortar okay. shop. I was going to ask what you thought of that because obviously it's interesting and yeah. but you haven't heard of it I hadn't heard of it um, I I guess time will tell yeah. um, if it's just newly opened right Is it it's been open about two months now right okay and it's really interesting because all the books face forward like they would on Amazon right and they have all the reviews underneath so you can scroll oh wow like a digital thing okay it's really cool amazing yeah they're but always innovating. I, I know. <laughs> That's why I thought <laughs> I'd ask what you. Always one step ahead. Yeah, but uh, but but it's, I I saw it as them kind of going backwards until I saw photos of it. Mm-hmm. When I thought, okay, no, this is actually a different bookshop to yes, a normal bookshop. Yeah. Well, it sounds really interesting, and mm. I'll be following that now and yeah. seeing what <laughs> yeah. actually happens with it because, um, you know, it's as I say, it's all about kind of trying to keep up and mm. and try things new and try new things and. Um, mm. Yeah, I thanks for flagging that to me. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. That's all getting edited out. But uh, yeah, you're welcome. I'll send you a link in a minute. Um, okay, so who are the favourite authors you've worked with within the comedy uh, slash gift slash non-fiction uh, I, realm? The two authors that I found really inspiring for me just in terms of kind of pushing me as well and because and I love to be quite creative and... Um, with, with Dan and Phil they were such mm. a dream and they were coming up with, with all different kind of ideas that were kind of beyond the book and but also for the book and they, they kind of pushed me creatively um, and and they were funny and they were really committed to, to, to writing it themselves and I'm really involved in every last little detail um, but actually you know it really made the book something quite special mm. and um, yeah I, re- I really enjoyed that whole kind of process but all my authors are wonderful and um, I love working with them all cool and because a lot of people want to know are publishers actually taking risks on new writers or are you sticking with established ones Oh, I can answer that. Yeah, but I but I felt like you kind of answered it by okay. b- with your with your stuff about looking for people online yeah. with new talents. Okay. 
but it would be interesting to know your take on because obviously from our perspective it probably looks a bit like you know all oh, these people keep churning out the same mm -hmm. people or, or or you know the people of friends of people or whatever mm -hmm. so it'd be interesting to know your take on yep. how, how much of a risk you you think you guys are taking on new writers and yep. yeah yeah okay um i um you know ebri really like looking for new writers we obviously have a really established kind of list mm. you know catlin moran's amazing danny wallace yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah catlin's fantastic and she's just announced another another book oh, which one? Sorry. Uh, it's <laughs> called um morana festo it's a bit of a political oh, okay. book um it's a but great title. She, yeah she's done a video about it so you should i've um, missed that Damn yeah it. you need to check that out I'm a big fan but, of hers. Oh yeah, I've she's amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I um, I didn't get to work with her unfortunately, but um, she was in the office um, <laughs> last week, and I just kind of watched her walk <laughs> walk away because I I was too like I fangirled. I yeah. hate that word, but I but no. I did, and I just kind of watched her and just yeah. was like, oh, I missed that opportunity. Yeah, but at least I saw her go. Yeah, I saw her face. <laughs> yeah. My friend um, had that. My friend saw her in a coffee shop and went over to her and went, I, I love you by the way. I, did, I just didn't know what to say. I didn't <laughs> want to walk over and then just walked away. <laughs> Oh, and, then she and then she texted me just saying, oh, I've just met Helen Moran. I was so cool. I was so, and I was like, were you, Doug? You you, I wouldn't have been cool. How would you be cool? Yeah. Um, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. I I'll had her on this. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you should, uh, yeah. yeah, we should try and see if we I'll can I'll try and talk to her about yeah. that. Yeah. I tweeted her the other day, but she didn't reply. Because oh. <laughs> I thought, this is a long shot, but why not? Um, <laughs> maybe she didn't see it. Uh, well, maybe. She probably gets a lot of DMs and at replies probably. and things. Yeah. yeah. We can talk about that another time. Yeah. But yeah. So anyway. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we have a lot of established authors mm. like Dan. Danny and Catelyn and um, you know uh, f f hundreds actually but <laughs> we're always always you know wanting the new writers they are the next kind of mm. stable house kind of author I guess mm. and um, you know as I say um, my control alt delete book uh, Emma Gannon's book she's a brand new kind of author in this in this world she's young she's cool and she's, you know, she's got a lot to say. And, mm. you know, we, we're publishing her and we're really excited about publishing her. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we, we love to kind of see fresh new voices. Mm. Um, it is all, always about the brand authors. And as I say, sometimes they end up becoming the brand authors. Mm. And, um, you know, that's what makes Ebri really exciting anyway. And an exciting place to work is that we are looking for fresh um talented writers and it isn't always kind of about the celebrity or the talent mm. um it's you know as i say danny and catlin have really fantastic um mm. voices and we're always always trying to find mm. someone who's who's got something to say that's mm. worth saying cool what's the best advice you've ever been given um for publishing as a as a commissioner or as a just uh both <laughs> okay um <laughs> you i mean when i was trying to crack the kind of publishing industry um the best bit of advice i was like always and i think everyone says this but just ask questions you know and you you've got these questions anyway if you're passionate mm. about something you want to learn about it and if you have the opportunity to kind of um, do work experience or um, you know do a part time job for even if it's in a you know even if you go and work in a bookshop mm. um, just be passionate be engaged ask the questions and I think when you're enthusiastic about something it really shows and um, mm. just keep keep at it and I guess that's the same for for writing and wanting to be published mm. um, you know just never give up because you just never know mm. and as I say you know there are some people who self-publish that then get publishing contracts and then mm. get film deals you yeah. know and um, you know it can happen and you've you know even at times when you're thinking god I'm not going to get this job or you know um, I'm never going to be published you, you've just you know there'll be someone out there who will appreciate the work you're doing and mm. you know you will find your audience your fine readers and who, who love what you're doing so just mm. keep being passionate i guess and um it will happen cool and what would be the best advice you've learned that you would like to give maybe a couple of thousand authors who will probably be tweeting you at the end of this <laughs> um i would say that um to 
I mean, my, my really key advice is to really make your proposal stand out. Um, don't go too extreme that I'm like, this is really weird, but try and <laughs> try and be unique enough that it catches our attention. Um, don't kind of, um, don't think that it's so weird that people aren't going to like it. But obviously, doing some really weird stuff. But you know, there there are certain <laughs> things out there that you know you think, oh, I just I I don't know. It seems a bit strange to suggest yeah. this idea, but actually, you just never know. Mm. Um, and I'd say that even if you get rejected by a publishing house, sometimes, uh, like a year later, they'll decide that what you had was the thing they want mm. right now, and you know don't bin it don't delete it from your computer store it away because you know eventually it could be the next book that everyone's after Mm. and um you know even if it's not yeah even if it's not for right now it could be for later Mm. and and to keep writing and if that's your passion then just you know enjoy it and um yeah i'm sure even if you self-publish you might end up reaching you know Mm those readers that you want to reach awesome well thank you very much for coming on thank you for having me cheers that was sarah i i really enjoyed chatting to her as a as someone who is about to self-publish a book next year i really enjoyed getting uh first of all the inside scoop on how quote unquote industry create books and notice books and what they're looking for but also their opinion on self-publishing and everything they do from finding the book to getting it onto a shelf because as anyone who has self-published before will know that process is universal regardless of whether you're doing it through industry or whether you're doing it on your own and it was just great to sort of get a step-by-step blueprint on how to do that and I'm pretty sure anyone who is thinking about self-publishing or is looking at getting a career in the publishing industry will get a lot from this podcast if you think you know anyone that would get a lot from it please do share it with them that really helps out Um, if you're enjoying this podcast and you would like to continue to support it please do consider becoming a patron Uh, please do consider becoming a patron you get extra perks like you get told about the podcast ahead of time you, you get your questions prioritized above other people's you get free seats to all the live shows i'm going to be picking one patron for the next couple of podcasts just to plug their work and just to help them get a little bit more exposure for this audience and the industry in general so if you want to become a patron and potentially be that person that gets plugged please do it by going to patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash ask the industry podcast if you don't want to do that you just want to do a one-off donation feel free to do that you can do that via PayPal, which there is a link on my website for at simoncane.co.uk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you very much for supporting. And I'll see you next time. Bye.